Thank you. We'll be recording this as well for uh, reference as necessary. My name is Thomas Hastaba. I'm the program director for Net Zero Cities, uh, which is supporting this mission. And uh, I'll uh, be introducing our panelists as well as uh, moderating the Q&A uh, at the end. So uh, the objective, given the, the timing, we've had several webinars. We'll be referencing those uh, in the course of this but also to give a brief update and then answer questions that any of you may have as you're pulling together your response. Uh, as always, I can see people are introducing themselves in the chat. So happy to see you um, put your name in there and, and let us know where you're coming from into uh, the chat. So we'll keep track of that. Um, just I will note there's a Q&A uh, because this is a webinar, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question, uh, that you want us to address, uh, I would encourage you to type it into the Q&A chat so that we can deal with it. Uh, we'll try to answer those as we go through in real time, if it's a quick and simple response that we can type into the chat, or else we'll um, pause and bring it out uh, for uh, discussion. I will repeat the question to the panelists to make sure we get the right response. Um, we scheduled this initially for an hour, but I will let you know we may run longer. Uh, depending on the time needs uh, that you all have. So with that, don't, uh, don't worry if we're getting close to the end of the hour and, and you still have, we still haven't gotten your question. We will uh, carry on and make sure we can address questions uh, both on this webinar and uh, going forward uh, after the webinar as necessary. So that's a lot of preliminaries. So let's go ahead and begin. I'm gonna begin by um, letting you know who our panelists are. Uh, I think you've seen and heard from them all previously, if you've joined the other webinars. Uh, Matthew Baldwin, who is the manager of the mission implementation team. Philippe Frizard, head of the unit at DG Research and Innovation with the commission. And then we have three colleagues from the Joint Research Center, Nadia Vetters, Juliana Upiani, and Miguel Lariaga Guardiola. Uh, hopefully I did justice to that pronunciation in uh, my raspy Friday voice. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to invite Matthew to kick us off with a few opening remarks uh, and take through a bit of uh, presentation uh, to get us started. Matthew, take it away. You're muted, Matthew. Oh, dear. There's always one, isn't there? Hello, everybody. Thanks, uh, Thomas, for your very kind intro. Uh, great to be with you all. This is, of course, the final webinar, the last chance before we come to the closing date of our call for expression of interest of the 31st of January. We want to be as efficient as possible to answer as many of your questions, or if you have outstanding questions as possible. We're not planning here to give you new information. Um, uh, all of that is available. If we can go to the next slide, please. All of that is available in what we call here, the next slide, please. Relevant documentation, it's coming, it's coming, trust me. There we are. The call for expression of interest, the info kit for cities, the frequently asked questions, how you can respond to the call for expression of interest and the preview of the questionnaire. All of these will be posted in the chat so you can drag them and, and drop them if you haven't yet done so. Next slide, please. We've had three previous webinars, and luckily for you, I haven't featured in any of them, so they're all watchable and clear, um, covering different aspects of the questionnaire. And these are also going to be posted in the chat, and if you uh, are interested in any particular area, there it's really, I think, becomes very clear how, the diff how we foresee the different aspects to be tackled. Next slide, please. What we thought we would do in this webinar is verbally, orally, I never know which is the right word, take you through quickly some of the questions that we most often get um, and, and to try to be as clear as possible uh, for you in those responses. And I'm going to quickly walk you through three such questions. The first we often hear from cities is that we want to respond to cities as a group. And the question you ask us is, should we submit a single expression of interest or one for each city? And if you're really interested, this is frequently asked questions 105 and 106. And to put it most clearly for you, we see you have two options. The first is that you can express the interest as a metropolitan region or an agglomeration. 
for example, of taking a French example uh, as, as the Ile de France. And, and by the way, we recognize there are other terms, so it doesn't have to be literally those two phrases. And then you'd have one single expression of interest submitted by the metropolitan region. By default, it would be committing the whole region, but you can, as you know, they're, they're then set out that we would exclude this and this and this part of the region. And all you have to do is explain that in the form as to why you're excluding them. The second option is that you express your interest as a grouping of cities. So here, I think it's important that, that your cities need to be geographically contiguous and linked by collaboration, often on transport, for example, by common strategies, by common investment plans. And in this case, what we'd ask you to do is to submit separate expressions of interest, stating the relevant political support from your mayor in each case, and indicate which other cities are part of your grouping and who is leading it. Okay, so those are your two options as we see it. And I hope that's clear. If it's not, we can come back to it in the questions. Next slide, please. So um, a lot of people have asked us, uh, or stated to us, they can't do the whole city. And we understand it's a big and a difficult and a complicated business. Um, and this is the standard answer we've been giving people. And I hope we can make it clear that our city's mission is indeed intended for cities. We are looking for high levels of ambition. Obviously, the ideal would be to have the whole city commit. And we think the learning processes in terms of the governance and in, in terms of the innovations needed in a city will be most intense if you can commit that for the whole city. Nonetheless, we recognize uh, that it's not going to be possible for every city to commit all of itself. So we've made it possible to exclude individual districts or sources of emissions. I'll say more about the sources of emission in a moment. So the next question we often get is, well, okay, you know, we could do it for one or maybe two districts, like a, a minority of the actual city. So the answer to that question is, we will not disqualify these a priori, if the districts meet the population thresholds. Remember, there are two. There's the 50,000 generally applicable population threshold. But if you come from a smaller member state, and you can see the details there in the asterisks, then the threshold is for 10,000 inhabitants. So these districts would need to meet that population threshold. Such bids, in our view, would have to demonstrate why their ambition is high and how and when the city aims to reach full climate neutrality for its entire territory. What does that mean for you in practice as you try to decide how much of your city you can commit? Again, obviously we prefer whole cities or nearly whole cities. And let me give you an example. If a city of say 150,000 people came forward with a plan to be climate neutral for two districts covering say 100,000 people, two thirds of the city, that would be more interesting for us, a priori, than as if a city of 2 million came forward and said, we're going to commit two districts amounting to 100,000 people because you'd be covering more of the city. Again, I'm not saying that we would disqualify upfront or we have setting some sort of policy that you know a big city that only committed a couple of districts would be out, but clearly we'd be pushing or we, we'd be interested to see that city commit more of its districts and a higher uh, population number. That's, I hope, a, a, a way to explain how we're addressing this. But again, the only rule, you know, there, there are no fixed rules. It is possible to uh, exclude uh, individual districts. It is possible to um, uh, submit a, a, an expression of interest covering individual districts or, or one or two districts, as long as the districts are above the population threshold. Next slide, please. Another question we hear regularly is that we would like to exclude a particular emission source. How do we classify uh, these emissions? And we're not here talking about, okay, so we can exclude all gas emissions or all um, or, 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 or diesel emissions, for example. That's not what we have in, in mind. When we talk about an entire emission source, we're talking about, for example, a district where there's a chemical factory and the chemical factory cannot meet the climate neutrality target by 2030. Um, or it could be the factory itself, it could be a port, it could be an airport, these are things we often hear. And so how would you do that? How would you classify these emissions? So again, you've got two options. The first would be to exclude the entire emission source from the outset. 
or secondly, keep it in the calculation and address its emissions as part of the residual emissions. And we, we talk about that elsewhere in the, uh, uh, in the papers around the expression of interest. For example, you can offset emissions via carbon sinks or by carbon credits up to a maximum of 20%. Um, we are looking for high ambition, but we would deem it acceptable that emissions from the excluded emission source, for example, from the port or the chemical factory, go unaccounted for, i.e. the goal as part of the, um, of the mission would then be to achieve climate neutrality by 2030 for the city, with the exception of the port or the chemical factory. In this case, what we would ask the city to do is to show how it intends to reach climate neutrality for this emission source at the later stage, and of course, by 2050 at the latest. So the short way to explain this, it's the same as if you are excluding a district. We would ask you to do the same thing in that case. And it is perfectly fine, by the way, to indicate in the questionnaire, you're still reflecting on how to handle this issue between the first option and the second option, as long as you're a little clear about what you would like to exclude. Next slide, please. Another question we often hear is, and it's heartbreaking because we do recognize how much work has been done, is that my city already has a climate neutrality strategy with a target date that's later than 2030. It could be 2040, sometimes it's even later than that. And, the, and you ask us often, can we still join the mission? So here we have to be very clear, we're not able to change, and we're not going to change the fundamental terms of reference. The target of the city's mission is climate neutrality by 2030, and this ambition needs to be clearly stated in the expression of interest. I stress the ambition needs to be stated. It, it's not at this stage important to say we commit to that. The commitment comes later in the contract. It could well be uh, that that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, even if your existing plan says 2040. You could use the mission to work with the mission platform and with us to accelerate your existing timelines and thereby get there by 2030. We do recognize it's difficult for a city which has spent a lot of time and effort and probably political, politically has sorted it all out to have a, a, a later timeline. Um, but um, we, do, uh, uh, we would accept in this case that uh, if a city wants to join the mission, it should state its wish, its readiness, its ambition, if you like, to accelerate to a 2030 target and to explain upfront what are the barriers and what are the constraints that it faces. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I said it would be three questions. It's one or two more. Um, oft, we're often asked, what form should the letter or declaration of commitment to take? Where should it be sent? Well, it's very simple. There's no template or formal requirement. Uh, you could choose, for example, a letter, which you can address to me, the mission manager. I'm always happy to get letters. But please don't send that separately by post or email. The, 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 the clearest and most operational way for us would be for you to upload that uh, and attach it to the questionnaire. We're often asked um, or, or, or told that you can't find the right code or ID for your city that's requested in the eligibility section. If you can't find this code or the options don't seem to apply to your city, please simply select other. This will not affect the eligibility of your city. Next slide, please. And then the last one, I promise you the last one, is that um, we're hearing, particularly in the last few days or so, that we only just heard about this call and we're running out of time to submit our expressions of interest. We understand um, we're not able to change the deadline because that would be very unfair to everyone else. The deadline remains the 31st of January. Um, what you need to do is perhaps try to find a quick way to do this. It's essential you fill in the sections on eligibility, including the declaration or letter that I just mentioned from your city's representatives, the mayor, and the additional information section there. The other sections of the questionnaire are not mandatory. It is in your interest, and it's obviously in our interest because we would like to get as much information as possible for you to fill that out as best you can. Um, the Net Zero Cities Consortium and we in the Mission uh, Secretary are fully available right up to that deadline of 5 p.m. Central European time on the 31st of January. But the basic message here is don't panic. And we know time is short, um, but if you're, you're really interested, revved up, ready to go for this, and you've got your mayor uh, interested and involved, it is not too late to start now. Next slide, please. And then once again, for further information, 
by email, that's how you can reach us. Um, on the web page, uh, if you want to pick up more information about it, that's where it is. Um, uh, the newsletter, which we just circulated, which I think has a mine of great information and uh, a number of useful links. Um, and that's, you would get that automatically if you've uh, uh, pre-registered. Um, it's all in there. Um, I think the one thing I'm missing here indeed, and I see Thomas has posted already, um, if you've got a question you want to address to the consortium, uh, Thomas has just posted the email address in the chat. So I realize I should have put that on my slides. You always realize too late. Thomas, I stopped there. I hope I didn't go too long. No, that is perfect. That is perfect. I just want to pause a minute if the uh, from the panelists um, you want to make some other statements or else we'll begin with the questions that are still outstanding. I know we're we're all working through these uh, in real time. Those that can be answered um, with a quick note back, you'll see those in the answered uh, portion of the Q&A panel. Um, but otherwise, I will begin uh, from the beginning um, of the open questions. We have several. So um, I think uh, Vika and possibly Philippe, you wanted to speak to the one uh, that I'll start with, which is if the evaluators or commission have any questions or need additional information regarding the explanations provided, documents uploaded, will they contact the cities or will they treat the information provided as a last version? For example, can we present the summary in our national language and take the time to translate it and then submit it in English just then when we are selected? Well, I can take that question if you want. Um, I think it comes back to, uh, should we get in touch with the, the applicants after the, the closure of the call to seek additional information or can you submit additional information after the closure of the call? And the answer to that is no. Uh, in the sense that uh, when you prepare your application, you submit your application, we have always, or, always told you and said that, that uh, you can submit the documents in your own language but that you should provide a courtesy translation of the documents that you upload in, uh, in English so that uh, they, they can be uh, used uh, by the evaluators when uh, looking at the, the, the proposal. So we should need not, we should not have to uh, ask for additional documents, for instance, translation after the closure of the call. And we will not either uh, go back to you um, if we need some clarification of the on the application that you have submitted in the course of the evaluation unless unless this is clearly an issue linked to clerical uh, uh, error or some some uh, some information that uh, that uh, we cannot uh, read for instance a document that we cannot read because it has been uploaded in a format that we cannot uh, we cannot open or something like that some only only for technical reasons we might come back to you but otherwise we will not come back to you in the evaluation great thank you very much for that the next question, how is the section measures different to the section current picture? Uh, and with that, could you please elaborate on the following question? One of the plans you previously selected was sustainable energy and climate action plan or sustainable energy action plan, CCAP or C. Was the mitigation pillar of your plan accepted following analysis by the JRC? So I think Nadia. Yes, I can speak to that. Thank you for the question. Um, the first part, um, the question on the measures, it forms uh, an integral part of this whole section that looks uh, in more detail at the current policies in place and implemented in the cities. Uh, it just gives you uh, the space to elaborate more on measures that you feel are key measures that have a high impact that will be of relevance in achieving uh, also your climate neutrality ambitions. On the second uh, question, um, the covenant of mayors for climate and energy um, follows a specific uh, methodology that um, guides cities in developing uh, their climate action plan, the so-called sustainable energy and uh, climate uh, action plans. And those are um, after having been reported in one of the official reporting systems for the Covenant Europe, the My Covenant, analyzed uh, by the uh, Joint Research Center and uh, cities do receive uh, a feedback on those plans, sometimes with uh, suggestions for uh, approval. Uh, and in the end, uh, those are, are accepted uh, as, um, well, 
having gone through a quality assessment by the GRC. So this is meant by this question. Uh, if this is the case, you have received a feedback report from the Joint Research Center that confirms this. That's all I wanted to say. Great, okay. And that was anonymous, so there's a follow-up. Please let us know. Um, I think this next one can be pretty quick uh, from Paris. Could you confirm the letter of application can be signed by the deputy mayor? Well, maybe I could take that one. I think um, as long as it's, uh, um, if it's clearly expressing the full authority of the city, that's fine. Um, but, you know, in that case, then we would not expect to hear, oh, it's only the deputy mayor, the mayor wasn't consulted or involved. Uh, so I think it, it, it needs to be in this case always done. We're looking for the full authority of the mayor in expressing the ambition of the city. If the, if the letter uh, is then um, uh, signed off uh, physically by the deputy mayor, I personally don't see that as a problem. I'm ha very happy the team wants to contradict me. No, I think that's right. And generally speaking, mayors have delegation, formal delegations that they often uh, provide to folks like a deputy mayor. So I think that I would concur with that. Next question. I think is a follow up question regarding attachment of files. Is it problematic if they are in the national language, French in this case, or does everything need to be translated in English? Okay, we've addressed this, but I think. The quick answer is um, we, we would like to have, uh, even if it's machine translation summaries uh, of those documents, uh, even if it's the executive summary or, or front part um, submitted, if at all possible, that's quite helpful for the facilitating the review. And I think part of the rationale is the sheer number of uh, these submissions that will need to be evaluated in a timely fashion. Um, it just adds to the time otherwise uh, to, to take a look and assess all of these. So um, I'll leave it open if somebody else from the panel wants to add to that. Uh, if I may to come back to that, uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, you, you should not um, expect that the evaluators that will review the, 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 the applications uh, necessarily speak the language of the applicant. So I think it's in the applicant interest to provide, uh, as I said, a courtesy translation or even a machine translation of the, the documents that have been uploaded in the national, uh, in the native language. Uh, because I, I, if you don't do that, um, then uh, you run the risk of uh, us or the experts uh, translating themselves the document. And uh, I think you prefer to have uh, in your application the a document that you have yourself translated. Thank you, Philippe. Okay, next question. Um, and I think, Nadia, I'm gonna check with you on this one. Uh, we are wondering how to choose the proper scale for the application. We have both city plans and larger plans with surrounding urban areas. The carbon neutrality will be evaluated at the metropolitan scale, but in full collaboration with surrounding areas, e.g. carbon sinks, reciprocity contracts, integrated methodologies. I'm not sure I, I fully uh, understand whether the question is, uh, should we apply as metropolitan area or a city or whether the question is, uh, what type of plans shall we um, You're asking, should refer they apply to? As, as the city or should they apply as the whole region? I'm not sure I have an answer to this. Maybe Matthew wants to comment. <laughs> Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give him something to think about. I mean, my sense of that is there's not a wrong answer to this. That's exactly. um, mm -hmm. And I think if you were going to apply as a metropolitan region, you may need to already have some formal commitments from the other municipalities. That may make that difficult in the last 10 days. So there would be, uh, my interpretation from the webinars and discussion we had, there would be no issue with you applying as a city, but you should describe the metropolitan regional actions that are um, referenced in your question. Um, Having said that, you could also apply as a, as the region, but I think you need to secure some level of formal commitment from those other municipalities to do so. Um, maybe Matthew, you want to add to that, or or correct me if I'm mistaken. Yes, all of that sounds reasonable. Um, if you want the simple version, have a look at the question I answered in my presentation, which is, um, you know, the 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 options open to you as a group of cities. 
Um, and again, as in all of these cases, to, you know, to pick up how much information to give if um, you're applying as the metropolitan re region, I, my answer is as much as you can give from the constituent parts, uh, which, are, which are of the, the constituent parts of the region, which are part of your, your bid, if you will. Um, but, you know, again, we recognize you may not have all the information, right. they may not have all the answers, which of course applies to everybody. So um, answering, I don't know, to some of the subparts would be also perfectly fine though. But Philippe, uh, if you would like to gloss on that, that's fine too. Okay, thank you. I think we're okay. Yeah, I think that's okay. You covered it. Yeah. Um, this should be quick. Could you provide any minimum points we need to add into the letter of declaration? Could it be two pages long? I mean, we don't provide templates, huh? so I mean, it's really up to you to to, yeah. to come up with uh, the information you you wish to uh, to to include in the the, the 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 statement. It's not it's not your uh, your uh, pitch uh, that uh, that uh, that statement. It's uh, so that is something that goes comes further, that comes later in the application. But uh, I mean, that, what did you what you should provide in that uh, in that document is the clear commitment of the the local authority. Yeah, to be very clear, it could be very short. I mean, and if it ends up being a couple of pages long because the mayor wants to express herself or himself in a lengthier way, that's fine too. Yeah. I think the next question is pretty um, simple. Question about estimation of capital requirements. What costs are meant, the overall cost for the city as a territory to be climate neutral by 2030 or only municipal costs? So we would be seeking for you to be getting the whole of the uh, territory of the city climate neutral, not just the city operations uh, or the municipal government costs. If you have both numbers, submit those. If you have only estimated the municipal or only detailed the municipal costs and you're, you need to still model the overall costs of the territory, then you can say that and share what information you do have. I think that's pretty clear. I don't know if there's any additional clarification you want to add from. Um, the panelists, no, that's okay. Just to help out my chairman, Thomas, um, I think there are quite a lot of technical things that maybe we could turn to Miguel uh, at this stage to clarify for us. Absolutely, let's do that. While we sort out some of these in the window, we can still answer quickly in a written form. So Miguel, do you wanna come in and speak to a few of the technical points? Yes, thank you, Thomas. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Ariaga. I work for the Joint Research Center, and I'm responsible for the provision of the, the platform that supports the, the core for expression of interest. So we thought it was a, a good moment to discuss or to, to share with you a few common practices to cover the most frequently questions, technical questions we get from you regarding the platform and, and some of the, 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 the things you would like to, to know and to ask. We always advise you to check the, the user guide, which is uh, uploaded along with a questionnaire because it's frequently updated. It has uh, different sections which, which can be useful to you. In fact, most of the things we can cover today, they are already in there. So that's, that's a, a good place to, to check. In the user guide, uh, there is a best practices uh, section where we cover different scenarios that can happen to you. One of them is this situation when uh, there are different people that need to complete different parts of the, the questionnaire. Uh, to do so, uh, we strongly advise you to organize so there is only one person completing the questionnaire at a given time from a given computer. Uh, we need to avoid having several people connected to the same questionnaire from different computers completing different uh, parts because that really can uh, lead to data uh, loss, uh, to data corruption. That's, that's important to remember. When one person is completing the questionnaire and it's, it's finished, uh, he or she can click on save as draft so that data is available to, to the next one when he or she wants to, to continue working on that. In that sense, there are a couple of events that uh, trigger a large exchange of information between you and the, or your computers and the EU servers. Uh, basically, when you open or when you reopen a questionnaire, the, the whole questionnaire, including attached files, all the information you already uh, uh, completed, is downloaded from the EU servers down to your computer. It happens in the background, it's not very visible, but it, it that happens and that takes time. In the same way, when you click on submit or when you click on save as draft, 
That's the, the opposite way. All the information which is in your computer, you see on the screen, it's uploaded to the EU servers. So that takes uh, some time. And now that the questionnaires are becoming a bit heavier because there are more files attached, more information on, on them, and there are more people working on the, on the, on the expressions of interest, that can take a, a bit longer than, than before. Uh, we kindly ask you to allow uh, sufficient time uh, for all those two processes to, to complete. So when you click on save, just uh, leave it running until it's, it's completed. The same thing when you reopen the questionnaire and avoid uh, refreshing the page or reconnecting to the to the questionnaire or just clicking randomly in different sections because that also can can affect the the, the exchange of information in the same way for instance um, uh, when you open or you reopen the questionnaire and you see some some sections uh, which doesn't don't have the data that you you completed before please allow sufficient time for this to happen um, now these days we are doing some tests in the worst case a scenario it can take up to seven eight minutes no more than that but yeah that can be some time to to wait um that is because the the load of the questionnaire is sequential as you walk through the different sections those sections have been downloaded uh, you can always uh, do this trick to go to the last section of the questionnaire the section line the barriers and the risks you click on that and that will trigger the download of the complete questionnaire to your computer it's going to take a little bit of time as we said but that will ensure that you see all the the information you completed before and it's the same situation for the save as draft uh, button Sometimes it's not visible when you reopen the, the, the questionnaire. Uh, it's a security, it's a protection measure, we could say. It will be only visible once the complete questionnaire has been downloaded to, to your computer. So again, just do the trick of going to the last section, and when the process is completed, you will see it again. And um, one last thing we wanted to, to cover with you today is the, the, the it happened to, to a few people only. It's, not, it's very rare that this happens, but uh, this is what, 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 what can happen sometimes. Um, uh, you are completing the questionnaire, you are uploading some files, you click save on draft, save as draft, and then you, you get the, the okay message, everything goes fine. But then when you return to the questionnaire, it seems that the, the files you uploaded previously, they are, they are not there. Uh, we can guarantee you that those files were sent to the to the EU servers correctly. However, there are lots of technical factors that take place when when this happens, and there might be this synchronization issue issue where you don't see those files present. Um, we understand that's a, that's an issue for you, of course, because you need to know what you sent already, and you need to know what's left to 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 submit or to upload. In cases like this, if this happens uh, to you, and uh, we saw some questions also in the in the chat before, uh, our recommendation for this is that you keep all the files locally in your computer and you continue completing the, the questionnaire as, as usual. You click on Safe as Trap, you just enter the, the information in the different questions, and you hold the, uh, the, the, the files up to the very end. So when you are ready to submit your, your expression of interest, you upload all the files in one session, in one go, and you just click on submit. And we can guarantee you that those files will, will arrive to us. That would be easier also for you to see that everything is completed. That's what you, that you, what you wanted to upload is, is already there. Um, you can do also, of course, partial submissions if you want. You can edit your contribution, your previous contribution. If, if that's the case, there is a link that will be in the email confirmation that you receive from the, from the system when you submit something. And it's important to remember that we just keep the, the last version you submitted or the last version, the last draft you, you, you saved. We don't keep the, the, the past history. That's important to remember. So um, as I said, uh, check the, the, the user guide. It's frequently updated, it's, it's useful. And if there are any, any issues, any questions, anything else that you, you would like to address to us, uh, as, as we said already before, uh, feel free to, to email us, of course, to the mailbox or use the contact us a link on the questionnaire um, because we are here really to, to help you with, with, with the processing. And I think that's that's all from from my side. I think Thomas, uh, back to you. I don't know if there are any. Other Great, questions. thank you. I'm going to ask um, maybe Nadja, you can help as well to run through those questions that Miguel has addressed, and we can um, see if we can clear those from the queue. Um, let's see. 
and I'm going to just find those that clearly require us to bring out and discuss live. Here's one uh, regarding the percentage of funding sources in section seven capital. Do you expect a full budgeting exercise listing the various interventions mentioned in section five ambition and estimating their costs in order to justify the percentages that are asked for? Moreover, what is other as funding source? Thanks in advance. Um, I'm happy to speak to this partially, Matthew, if you would like to, or, or someone from the JRC. You're muted still, Matthew. Second time. I'm, I think I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Philippe or maybe Nadia on, but you go Great. first, Thomas. Perfect. I'll let, uh, I'll let one of my colleagues go, but if, if they prefer, I can speak to it. I think it's more for Nadia. Okay. Um, I, I only have a very short answer. It's uh, basically, if that's available, that's excellent. And <laughs> please do provide it, but it's by no means expected. So I don't know, Thomas, if you want to. <laughs> no, I think that was, that was my answer even more succinct than I would have said, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> we don't expect a full budgeting exercise to be done just to submit the COI. It's uh, provide the estimates that you have uh, and are available to you. Um, and as you're estimating costs, you can you can add in the box where there's room to add additional explanatory text, text excuse me, where you are in the process of developing these estimates. So um, it's really just to gauge where you're at. It's not an evaluation of how well you've done that so far. And, and let me to, to, to chip in on this to repeat what I've said in different fora in the last few weeks and months, this is not a beauty contest. And if you don't have, and if the answer to this question is, I don't know, the honest answer is I don't know, that is not a disqualifier. Of course, if you've got the additional information, that's good to have. All right, this is one I think we should spend just a few minutes on. Could you give an idea on the investment slash staff needed to put together the city contract? if selected based on expression of interest. No direct budget is given to cities at that, at that moment. Will cost for research work needed to put the city contract together be covered? Matthew, I'm gonna ask you to start and then I'll provide more detail about what net zero cities will be doing. Yeah, thank you. I think it's good that we both, uh, we both tackle this. Um, I think the short answer to that is that the costs will vary enormously depending on what work has been done already, the size and the complexities of your city and the size and the complexities of the additional challenge that you face. So it's hard to put a, a, a real number on it. We do recognize there'll be additional costs, including specifically administrative costs in cities. Um, and I think Thomas, it'd be good if you could explain your estimate given the cities you've already worked with who have tackled this challenge. We do recognize this is an important uh, question, but no, at this stage, we're not gonna be awarding uh, specific funding to tackle this from inside the mission. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, I think maybe three quick points on this. Um, one is uh, we, we have um, reasonable experience with cities in both Sweden and Spain that can we can connect you with to get a sense of how they have experienced this themselves. I think there's no better um, better information than to go to the source. So you can follow up with, with me directly and I'll connect you to those folks and you can get some information and share there. I think there are two other points I'd like to make on that. One is Net Zero Cities is currently building out its plan to provide support to the cities coming into the mission with initiating and getting through the climate city contract process. Um, uh, so we will be providing you with some level of support um, I think that what that will look like will be broad ranging information about what others are doing and how to approach that. A general outline of what the process will look like and what information needs would be necessary to bring forward. Um, but then from there, we would really be looking to build from you a very specific and tailored approach that works for your city. Um, having said that, I think you can assume you would need a, a, a small team of staff who are gonna be able to roll up their sleeves and focus on this uh, for a period of time. Uh, I don't think this should be a massive undertaking, but it should be a sustained undertaking and it would require the attention of some senior staff. 
Um, without going any further, it's probably easiest to just have a specific conversation with you uh, and connect you to some of the cities, uh, as noted, who've got some significant experience already developing these contracts. So I'll, I'll make sure to drop my uh, contact in the, in the answer so you can follow up directly. It's great, Thomas. Um, could I rudely suggest, um, because I think it's an important issue, which we've had a lot of questions about, that I jump in and try to answer the question on offsetting, if that's all right for you? Please do. Uh, so the question was, um, can you please explain in more detail how offsetting with carbon credits work? Which projects will be accepted? Uh, and I recognize that's an important uh, question. It is addressed in the frequently asked questions, but I think it's worth saying a word about it here. So the answer is offsetting with carbon credits is accepted in principle. Of course, the goal of the, of the, the objective of the mission is to aim for net zero uh, emissions for climate neutrality by 2030. The reduction of any greenhouse gases at the source should be considered as the absolute priority. So then you have, what do you do with the residual emissions? Uh, and, and let's classify those as the ones that are impossible to eliminate at source within the period by 2030. They would need to be compensated through carbon removals in preference within the city boundary, e.g. nature-based solution, planting a whole stack of trees or industrial rem removals or replacements, or indeed by carbon credits. In any event, all carbon removals and carbon credits should be robust and of high quality. The last thing any of us can, can um, uh, survive is that we're all accused of a terrible greenwashing exercise here. They must be certified based on the regulatory framework for the certification of carbon removals. The European Commission is going to come forward with this proposal in 2022 and thereafter. So you can see this is not for now. Missions, the cities in the mission would need to report to the Commission on the amount and the origin and the type of certified carbon removals to neutralize the remaining residual emissions. In any case, we're point we're stressing, and I'm sure you'll understand that the level of residual emissions should be as low as possible and will depend on the situation of each individual city. As a guideline, it should not exceed 20% of the baseline greenhouse gas inventory for the whole, uh, for the whole city. An example, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, you uh, uh, um, decide to construct a, a photovoltaic plant outside the city boundary. Would this be accepted? Answer, yep given, uh, or, or if I should say, the credits that are generated are properly certified according to the regulatory framework uh, for the certification of carbon removals that we're going to uh, come up with. So it's a complicated question. We know it'll probably be important to a number of cities, um, but the guidelines need, we need to be fairly precise about how that'll work. Again, not necessarily for your expression of interest, um, uh, yeah, you don't have to have shown you've worked out uh, exactly how much residual uh, emissions you're going to have or how many carbon credits, but I thought it's important to explain that principle for those of you trying to weigh up if you can indeed meet the ambition of being climate neutral by 2030. Back to you. Thank you. All right, this is a, a longer one. Good afternoon from Espoo, Finland. We are working very closely with local stakeholders, such as universities, research institutes, businesses, and citizen groups, and are planning to update our climate neutrality roadmap towards 2030 in close cooperation with them already yet in 2022. We are planning to use this process to also work towards our climate city contract. Is that something that would fit well with the mission and how you would expect the first cities uh, being in the CCC process, uh, is this something we should elaborate in our in our application? So I'll, I'll start and then I'll open it up, uh, Matthew, for you and others. I think two points I'd make. Yes, that is consistent. Um, two, it's also completely appropriate to be in the process of updating your climate neutrality roadmap. We know most cities, the large majority of cities, do not yet have a climate neutral by 2030 roadmap or plan. So we expect that to be the case. Um, and we look forward to actually uh, seeing how that process unfolds. Um, but I'll leave it to uh, Matthew and others to add to that if they choose. Is your computer frozen on mute? Mm -hmm. That help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Sorry, I'm stuck. Um, but um, 
no, I, I fully agree with what you said. I think uh, greetings, uh, uh, friends in Espo. I mean, the, this is a good example of the kinds of things that we very much welcome you bringing to our attention. Um, and, 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 and cities are, are, are incredibly varied on this. Uh, cities are working with universities, with local research institutes, with businesses. All of these things are great things to elaborate on the, in, the, in the questionnaire. Um, I think the other part of your question is how, how soon do we expect the first cities to be to being part of the, the, of the climate city process? Um, so, I mean, this is a moment where perhaps I can answer a, a, another question, which is linked to that. When are we going to announce the results? It is, I think, uh, uh, very clear that we have a lot of cities that are going in uh, to express their interest. We have well over 400 that pre-registered, um, and we, we believe that well over 100 are working on those expressions of interest. It's gonna take us time to do this process properly and thoroughly. We'll be working closely with our friends in CINEA and JRC to make sure that we take those decisions in a, in, a, in a very careful way. So I don't think you can expect answers probably, well, I think at the earliest by the end of March. And thereafter, we will, um, uh, we will discuss with the consortium how quickly we can start the work on the, uh, the climate city contract process. Um, and again, that's not a precise science either. We're talking probably around the middle of the year. And if I could add one more thing here, Thomas, which I know uh, we've perhaps inadvertently drawn a lot of attention to. Uh, when people ask us when the work would start, we've sometimes talked about a, a group of 30 cities being the first that would begin their work on the climate city contracts uh, with you and the consortium. And I think we probably uh, allowed that to become a rather too big an issue. In reality, we're going to treat the 100 cities the same. You will have the same access to information, to financing, to joining in deep demonstrator pilots. Um, the, the, the reason we've done that is a resource issue for the consortium who have correctly, I think, uh, told us that with the existing uh, money we've allocated to them under the Horizon 2020 grant, they can probably only get down into the detailed work on the contracting process with around the first 30 cities. If you're not in that first group of 30, don't panic. We will get to all of you and you may actually benefit from having a bit more time to think about it and to see how the processes are going with the others. So I think that's an important issue. Uh, I, I could just take a moment to, to clarify that. Thomas, do disagree if you wish or feel. Oh, no, that, that's, that's acceptable. And, and you know, I think we're working in, on that to support that in a couple of ways. One is, um, has, as has been noted, you know, the, the question of, of that was previously discussed around, you know, the first 25 to 30 on the climate city contract process, it's, it's literally a function of resource constraints in the short term, but that goes away over time. Um, I think that what we're also recognizing to, to Matthew's point about everyone will have access to the same information and resources is we're building an onboarding process that will be, um, supporting all of the cities as they come into the mission. So not just to select uh, initial set. So um, hopefully that clarifies things and, and it provides some assurance that, that there's not gonna be uh, sort of two different universes within the mission itself. Um, Matthew, I think while, while we're on this sort of topic, I think a few things to speak to. There were a couple of questions raised about cities that are contemplating still how to respond because they're concerned about their ability to achieve the 2030 target, or they're concerned about their ability to identify if it's a large city, for example, a portion of the city and trying to parse that. And if they're still not sure of those things, what's your advice to them as they're trying to contemplate that? And we've had several cities raise that point, uh, not just in this webinar, but outside of it. Yeah, we've had the same questions too, and it's a, I appreciate the question because it tells me that cities are taking this seriously. Uh, we don't want uh, cities thinking, "Oh, this is just any old commitment, and we can, we can, we can, you know, sign the forms, uh, and we'll be in this thing, and it's going to be useful, and then we'll see how serious it is." We really want cities to take the process of being climate neutral by 2030 seriously. It may well be that for some cities, this is just not reachable for a multitude of different reasons. There's no shame in that. You, you won't be excluded from our discussions. There'll be ways in which you can connect up if that's a decision you, you reach. We're certainly not looking for you to say, yeah, we can, we know we have the ambition of climate neutrality. If you're pretty certain that you, there's just no way that you can get there, even when you've taken into account 
that you can exclude parts of the city or you can exclude emission sources or indeed that you can use the offsetting. So take it seriously. Um, um, uh, there's no particular benefits uh, uh, in my mind to joining a mission where you can't meet the objectives. That all said, um, if you've got any doubts and if you're really on the, on the, on the, right on that bubble trying to decide whether you can get there. My advice would be to be very honest about that in the uh, application process and to submit your EOI. It's only my personal view. Maybe we'll regret that because we were swamped by a lot of people who are, who are still really trying to consider it, but it's important. We won't be having further calls. The mission to choose the 100 climate neutral cities is gonna be set up from this call. There's no benefit from hanging back or, or trying to join at a later stage. This is, this is the moment. Um, and in particular, you might want to, to answer the second part of your question there, Thomas. If you're still trying to figure out exactly how to manage the exclusion of a district or multiple districts or emission sources, be clear in that in the form to say you've still got some technical work to do. Um, uh, you, you know, we are, we're, not, uh, we're not exactly sure how we're going to do this. That's all fine. Um, you can fill in some of these details later. That would be my advice anyway, but please, colleagues, it's important that we get this right. If anyone wants to uh, finesse that answer, go ahead. Let's see if anyone else wants to speak to it, but uh, I would say there's not a lot more to say to that. That's a, it's a, it's a really a judgment call at the, at the city level as to how you want to evaluate that choice. Um, there's not a wrong choice um, and we're happy to support um, you know, cities coming in going, we're not quite sure how to get there. Uh, and we're concerned about our ability to be there. But that's the idea. That's part of the idea of a mission is we don't actually know how cities are going to get there. Um, so this is really about it, taking a little bit of a leap that our ambition and our intention are going to help us learn uh, what it is that we need to take. So um, that's not something to take lightly. Um, but I think we do recognize that in the in the process. And that is is actually part of it. Um, I know we're, we're getting close to time. We will keep going. Philippe, did you want to come in on this? Yes, yeah, Thomas, if I, if I may, because uh, I noticed that there are quite a number of questions regarding the evaluation of the Yes, that was, I was just going to ask you. Yes. Okay. So you, maybe we can clarify a little bit the, the process, uh, because Matthew has explained a little bit what will be happening once we have selected the, the cities, but there is a step in between the uh, the submission and the, uh, the, the, the the implementation, which is basically the selection of the application that we are going to receive. And I think we have already explained uh, how we are going to go about the evaluation of the applications that will be submitted to us by the, in the call for expression of interest. Basically, there will be two phases in this evaluation. The first phase will be done by independent experts they will be looking at the content of the applications that we will, uh, we will receive, and um, they will rate in particular the open questions, because you know that the questionnaire that uh, we have designed has basically a number of closed questions, which uh, you are answering by uh, yes, no, or uh, through uh, multiple choice uh, answers question, uh, format. And we have open questions where you uh, provide some information on, for instance, the level of ambition and uh, the, 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 the state of readiness, readiness uh, and so on. Uh, so those questions, the closed questions, as well as the open questions, will be uh, graded uh, by uh, independent experts. Uh, and then there will be a second phase that will be done by the Commission services that will ensure that the principles and the criteria that we have provided in the uh, in the, the, the documents that we have prepared for the mission are res respected, namely the, the, the criteria and the principles of inclusiveness, diversity, and geographical balance. For instance, we have indicated very clearly from the start that we would like to have cities from every member state participating in the, in the, in the mission. So one of the criterion that we will use is the geographical balance and the diversity of the uh, of the, the applications that we will receive. And this is something that we will do in the second phase uh, within the commission services. So basically in a nutshell, that's uh, how we are going to go about it. So I, we, we want to have as many applications as possible. Uh, that's very clear. So uh, if you are still hesitating, do not hesitate much longer. Try to put as much information as possible in your application and press the button submit. 
uh, then we will evaluate the, 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 the proposals that uh, we will receive uh, through the process that I mentioned. And uh, then there will be a decision that will be made on the, on, the, on the list. That means that we aim to have at least 100 cities in the, in the, the mission selected that will uh, move further in the, the, the process of implementation of the mission. But then we will certainly not ignore the other application. And that is something that uh, we, we, we are also re reflecting on. That means that uh, even if you apply and you are not selected among the 100, you have indicated to us your commitment to move to a process of climate neutrality. And that is something that we will have to take into account also in the, in the, in the, in the very near future. And uh, it's very likely, basically, that uh, we will not tell you, uh, even if you're not among the 100, that uh, we are going to reject your application. Thank you for that. Perfect. Okay, this is a good question. Could you please summarize the relation between completing expression of interest survey and other related EU Horizon Europe mission calls? For example, Horizon Mission 2021 CIT 02, is my city required to be among 100 cities to be eligible for participating in the following competitive calls? Thanks. Philippe? Yeah, this is my favorite question. And uh, I've been answering that question already uh, yesterday and the day before. And uh, I hope that I'm consistent in my answers. So basically, uh, there are two different processes. One is the call for expression interest, which you will apply to in order to be part of the mission, uh, the city's mission, and which will trigger support that will be provided by the mission platform and so on. And then there are the activities that we have in the Horizon Europe framework work program for the, the city's mission, which uh, has been developed. Uh, last year, we have already calls and topics that have been launched. And uh, we say very clearly in the work program for the city's mission that the activities that we have in that work program uh, support the implementation of the city's mission. That makes sense because this is uh, this is budget that is allocated to the to the mission. And we are we have been preparing these activities to respond to the needs of the cities that commit to the objective of climate neutrality. So that's basically what we want to get from the, uh, the calls and the topics that we have in the work program for the city's mission. We want to get cities that commit to the objective of the, 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 the mission, namely climate neutrality by 2030 or 2050, which is the second objective of the, um, of the mission. They don't, have, they don't have to be selected in the call for expression of interest of the city's mission. The two things are separate. So you, you can very well apply to a topic of the web program for uh, the city's mission in Horizon Europe without necessarily being a city that has been selected in the call for expression of interest of the city's mission. But you will have to indicate in your application, in your proposal, that you actually commit to the objective of the, of the city's mission because this is the rationale of the activities that we are supporting in the, 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 the web program for the city's mission. I hope I'm clear. I think that was quite clear. All right, I'm just checking. There's a few technical questions there. Again, if I can ask Miguel and others to make sure we've covered those. If not, um, just raise your hand. I think um, I'm seeing a couple of questions saying time is tight and, and they're worried about the time it's gonna take to translate everything or you know, directly inputting um, in the open text spaces in, in English as being a barrier or difficult. So, um, Philippe, you spoke, spoke to that a little bit. You may want to uh, elaborate or else if someone from the JRC wants to add a little bit of um, both comfort and encouragement in terms of what to expect uh, under the circumstances. Maybe Miguel, no? I think on the translations, um, maybe we could repeat, uh, Philippe. What about machine what do, translations? Yeah. yeah, what do we expect in terms of mm. free text fields and uploads? Yeah, and here's a, yeah, like a very specific one, right? We will be short of time for translating our answers to open questions. Are we taking a risk and not translating them? Well, but just to repeat what maybe what Philippe said, that our advice then would be 
to bung it through a machine translator. It doesn't have to be a perfect translation. Yeah. Um, we can do it at our end, but it's probably better that you've done it so that it's it's your work and, and you've done it with a machine translator that you're comfortable with, because that makes sure that the text is more authentic from your end. Right. But don't worry too much. We we understand that you're not necessarily going to be able to produce a, you know, a beautiful, perfect translated version uh, in English, but we would ask you to put it through a machine translator. Is that right, Philippe? That's correct. Great, thank you. Um, any can if anybody has concerns, just reach out to us, and we'll make sure to um, talk further as necessary. There's a note saying the technical question about links has not been answered yet. Let me just capture that. Uh, you informed we can add links, but it doesn't seem to be possible to use hyperlinks. So the link needs to be spelled out, and with the limit of uh, characters, this is not an option. How do we solve that? Is it possible to do hyperlinks? And in what in that case, how? Or can we add a document with all the links we want to share uh, as an uploaded document? In that case, where? Leave that to the JRC to respond. Yeah, I think as a general guidance, we would really like to encourage you that you um, provide all the essential information um, as part of your answers. Uh, there is a, a size limit indeed, and that's for a reason, <laughs> because also evaluators uh, and experts cannot digest uh, hundreds of pages. Uh, so please make an effort to really um, capture the essence of what you want to present in the questionnaire um, as part of your free text questions without us, or not us, but the experts having to consult additional information uh, provided through through hyperlinks. Technically, yes, um, indeed, uh, in the documents um, that you upload, you can also provide uh, links um, that that is uh, possible. Wherever you have the option to upload documents, you can uh, attach as many documents as you wish. And if you wish to provide a document with supplementary uh, links, um, it's advisable to probably give a short preview what can be found at that link so that uh, it's taking uh, less effort to, to navigate through the documents but the general guidance is really um, when it is about specific questions that should be answered with free text please try to put the information without uh, one having to revert to, to additional external sources. Thank you Nadia. Okay, we're getting closer to the, we've gone through a lot of questions. We're getting closer to having covered all the questions. I'm gonna to ask to look at the colleagues to look at the Q and A chat. I'm just gonna check the other. There's one yeah, Tom, I, um, I wonder if I could jump in on. Yep. Uh, I think it's an important one. Um, so someone, again, I'm sorry, I don't know who has asked the question, is it correct to say that the excluded area so if in your expression of interest, you took out a, a district or, or, or an emission source, would not be able to benefit from the resources provided under the mission. So my answer to that, and maybe Nadja, you'd like to add a, a slightly more technical scientific point of view. I think the key thing is that the city will be asked if in the expression of interest or afterwards to explain how the excluded area is going to become climate neutral and by when. The goal, of course, is for the whole city to get to be climate neutral. So for me, there's no problem with the area benefiting from the resources of the mission. For example, if you excluded a port because they couldn't get there, I wouldn't have a problem if, for example, under the under the mission, there was a uh, there was a, a project which you were part of to consider accelerated ways in which the port could get to climate neutrality as soon as possible. So that would be the way I'd look at that. But now, did you want to add something to that? No, I think I, I would uh, fully agree. And indeed, um, even an excluded area um, typically would have interlinkages with the whole uh, city environment. So it's not even technically or, or <laughs> like uh, practically possible uh, to not address a specific area or, or fully exclude it. And uh, Obviously, in an excluded area, uh, one needs to work even harder in this period until 2030, even if it doesn't in the end count towards the climate neutrality target achievement, still action needs to happen there. And yeah, this is just to confirm indeed what you had been saying. Thank you. There's also a question. Sorry, someone wants to come in. No, well, I was just going to Perfect. add that, uh, I mean, an excluded area might even benefit from uh, RNI, research innovation actions that are supported in uh, the work program. 
because uh, it's very clear that uh, if we are already developing uh, now, only now, research innovation, uh, research innovation solutions to address issues that are faced by those, uh, those excluded areas, we will only be able to implement them after 2020, 2030, for instance. But that will still be within the, the remit of the, of the mission and the ambition of the cities to, to have the, the whole uh, area of the, of the, of the city uh, climate control uh, within the, the horizon of 2050. Thank you. I think we've covered this with uh, Matthew or Philippe, but there are a couple of questions still hanging in there. One is wondering about the smart cities part in the uh, yeah. project scope and the other, the other um, why was the threshold of population set at 50,000 and what was that decision based on? So if we want to address those just as a follow up for people. Just very quickly, if I may, I mean, there is a place in the questionnaire on the on where you can express uh, everything you have been doing and everything you're planning to do in relation to what we call the smart city part, the, the digital smart, the um, IT infrastructure part. Um, again, we're asking more questions about climate neutrality because that's the target. But our mission is 100 climate neutral and smart cities. I, for one, you'd need to work very hard to convince me that a city can get to climate neutrality by 2030 without being very smart in all sorts of ways, digital and others. So we, we're inviting you in that section to be very specific, including where you've been participating in other smart programs uh, of the European Union, such as the Intelligent Cities Challenge and others. So there's plenty of scope for you to spell that out. Um, and I've forgotten the second one. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Thomas, the second question. Uh, the 50,000 uh, oh, yes. minimum size for the cities. I can now reveal that there was not a huge scientific study to assess whether or not we were going to go with the 50,000 limit. Um, we, we had to put the cursor somewhere and we had to put it there quite quickly. Um, and in reality, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's been very justified by the type of response we've had. Um, remember that we are looking for cities, particularly the larger cities to come in above 100,000, that's great. If you are a 50,000, you qualify. And if you come from a member state without that many larger cities, then the population threshold comes down to 10,000. Remember, this is a research and innovation project. We're trying to look in the round to, to get as many rich learning experiences to help all cities get there eventually. So I really very much hope, and I'm sure we will have, cities uh, in the threshold between 10 and 50, and plenty of cities between 50,000 and up. And I hope also some of the, the really bigger cities, each of these cities will face different challenges to get to climate neutrality and you're all very welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's see if we're getting there. I think we're getting there. For those who are still there, we're reposting um, the links for webinars and other information, FAQs, et cetera. There's also on that web page, there'll be a, a, an email link to the mission team that you can follow up on. And again, I, I added my email there as well, if necessary, um, for people who need support or questions. If you are, this seems like an odd question. If you're a city larger than 50,000, but your geographic area doesn't comprise 50,000 inhabitants, do you not, uh, are you not qualified? I'm not sure how a city can be larger than 50,000 if its geographic area doesn't comprise 50,000. I think I have a philosophical problem with understanding that question. Yeah, I mean, I would say if the city has an official <laughs> census population above 50,000, you should be just fine. Is that right, Nadia, Philippe, anything to add? Maybe. And Philippe, you might want to clarify a little bit what I said on 50,000 uh, about the origins of it. I made maybe made it sound as excessively unscientific. Well, I think that we based ourselves on the experience, past experience from uh, the commission and particularly, if my memory is correct, DG Regio, uh, which applied some, uh, some definitions on uh, all these uh, legal uh, 
structures for uh, cities and communities and functional urban areas, uh, legal administrative uh, areas, and so on. Flowing. But in any case, it's a question of putting the cursor somewhere. I mean, a city yeah, doesn't exactly. change in its legal nature when it goes from, you know, when it when it achieves its 50,000th 50, 50, resident. And maybe I should just say we do appreciate the cities that are just under that threshold and are very uh, passionate about it. Uh, you know, we're very sorry about that, uh, the, the toughness of that definition, but we do need to put the cursor somewhere. The included area to reach 2030, I mean. Ah, I see. So I think the, the clarification there, Sarah, if this, if this is helpful. So the city as a whole should apply and you should designate that area that you are targeting to achieve climate neutrality by 2030, even if that geographic area of the city is less than the total population of the city. So you, what I understand is you're saying the city wants to join the mission and propose a segment of the city so there may be excluded areas and so that's how you'd want to approach that i'm I, we've, I think we've been agreeing with each other all the way through i'm not sure i completely agree with that but i mean <laughs> so we have a last minute discussion i think going back to the discussion we had about um uh, cities excluding districts and i think we've said then that the the constituent parts that are left must be greater than 50. So I think let's take a worked example. Let's say you were a city of 51,000 people and you propose to exclude a, a district amounting to you know, 20,000. So in fact, you're only bringing 40 within it. I think in my view, that would not qualify. Um, I think uh, it would be, or well, let me put it another, it would be unfair to some of those cities that are just below the 50,000 threshold who'd like to come in and we're ready to go for the whole city. But, um, um, so that's my quick appreciation. I haven't heard that question before. Uh, Philippe, uh, Thomas, do disagree. No, I mean, Daniel. I think for the sake of uh, consistency, I think I would agree with you. <laughs> now, do you, have we been more precise on that somewhere in, in, the, in the thing? I mean, I don't mind being told I've got it wrong. It has happened to me before. I have to admit, I wasn't focusing on the whole thread of the discussion, so I'm not sure. <laughs> no. Well, I think it's an important one for people at the margin. Let me just repeat the point. So the city is the city as 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 measured by its official population is more than fifty thousand. Um, they propose to exclude a region which takes it below that fifty thousand um, uh, threshold. My answer, in polite disagreement with Tom's, is that that would take a city outside the scope of the mission. Okay, so I see you nodding. Um, I would agree with this, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's clear and I stand corrected on, on what I mean there. It's good to show we disagree even up to the last minute on some things. Well, it's not that helpful for Sarah. Sarah, I would encourage you to, to <laughs> submit. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's also true. I mean, if in doubt, submit, I think is a very good- uh, and, embrace, and embrace the spirit of the mission, which is, you know, we'll try to figure it out. Um, that's the goal. Thomas, I think we're starting to lose people, um, yeah. uh, which I think is a good sign in the sense that I don't see a lot more new questions coming in and uh, we've webinared them out. Um, yes. But maybe let's just pause a second to see if there's a burning question we missed. Exactly. Folks, are we missing anything? Okay, I see from our, our, our Christian manager in chief, uh, Vipka Pankauk, who's behind the scenes, she says there's nothing pending. <laughs> yeah, I think, so, I think you can wrap it up. Tom. We're just giving people, even the shy people, a chance to get their questions typed in or react to anything that they've heard. So, and I, uh, I'll, I'll let people start to drop off. I just want to remind people since once the meeting's closed, you'll lose the links in the chat that you may want to grab those. Um, copy them into your desktop um, so that you have them um, to take with you. And obviously you can, you can, you know, do a web search and you'll find the page, but uh, it, it'll save you a little bit of time if you have additional questions. Please reach out, uh, let us know, and uh, we'll look forward to um, answering any questions along the way. Um, there's Uh, uh, we'll answer questions along the way between now and the 31st, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody's submissions.
British cities eligible to apply? We've heard this question before. Matthew, as a Brit, I, just, I have to answer that one, don't I? Yeah. Um, it's very clearly set out in the frequently asked questions. Uh, and not just British cities, by the way, if your city comes from an associated country or your your uh, country is in the process of, uh, of negotiating associated agreements with Horizon Europe. Um, and remember that um, you know, a large part of this is done on Horizon 2020, you may apply. But we are asking cities in that situation to explain how they will manage in terms of resources because they won't have access, for example, to structural funds, to funds coming from the recovery and uh, resilience facility, or indeed other EU programs. So we are asking you to go an extra step to show perhaps how your government or your region is going to support you with some of the, um, to replace some of the other financial and funding resources, which we hope our cities will benefit from. So that's the additional step you'd need to take. Perfect. Okay. I think we've got all the questions. I think we've uh, exhausted ourselves and others in the process uh, after another full week, I'm sure for everyone. So. Thank you again. Um, again, uh, you got 30 seconds to copy the links and the emails in the chat if you need them, uh, so you can take them with you. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you uh, and good luck to you all in your efforts. So thanks again very much. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a terrific weekend. I hope you're not spending the whole weekend on your applications. No, they, they should. <laughs>